Today we're headed down to St. George, Utah to chat with Brian Summers. How are you, Brian? Oh, very well. Thank you. Good. Now you're a long time leading Saints listener, right? Yeah, I am. Yeah. I, I, I think I started listening back in 2015. Wow. 2000. I was just such a young, cute uh, podcaster, you know, <laughs> didn't have yeah. a clue what I was doing. So <laughs> that's awesome. And were you a bishop at that time? Yeah, I think I just, just uh, uh, barely become a bishop. And, nice. and yeah, it was really good to find it. I remember, uh, I mean, a lot of them were really helpful. And I still remember one in particular with the stake president in New Mexico that just, I listened to it oh, maybe yeah. three or four times. It was very, very helpful. Yeah, that's cool. Awesome. What, and did someone recommend it, Leading Saints, to you? Or did, did Google put it in front of you? Uh, it must have been Google because I have no memory. I don't even remember the first time finding it. I just, as long as I've been a bishop, I just remember having it. Oh, that's cool. So well, I'm glad glad it served you well. And, and it was in uh, St. George where you served as bishop? No, it was Yuma, Arizona. Oh, wow. Yeah. Is that, uh, I don't know much about Yuma. Is that uh, a, a large city or a small it's about the size of St. George. So you got oh, okay. about 100,000 people in the summer and 200,000 in the winter. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, any any highlights from serving as bishop that you think back on or principles that would be worth mentioning before yeah. we move on to our subject here? Yeah, there were a few things I learned. Um, one of them is uh, like if you've got the spirit, it's actually the easiest uh, calling in the church, I think, if you have the spirit, because you just mm. follow what the spirit says, things fall in place. If That's you don't cool. have the spirit, oh, it's like walking up a stream. It is the hardest calling in the world. I uh, would talk to my parents on Zoom every Sunday night. And if they said, boy, you look tired, I would. I noticed a pattern. I would uh, think back during the day, and it was a day I didn't feel the spirit much. I was coming. I was working just as hard as any other day. Mm. Um, but if I didn't feel the spirit that day, like I just looked it by the end of the day. So the spirit's yeah. key and you got to get the spirit. Love it. Uh, now, have you always been a lifelong reader of like church history or yeah, history I, in general? Yeah. Well, I was a huge reader as a kid. Like as a kid, I was a huge reader. And then in high school, I was a, I was a massive reader. I would just, uh, some summer days, I would just spend all day reading and I really got into church history back then. Yeah. And uh, it, primarily, it's history. That I mean, reading about people is that. Would you say that's the the primary focus of your reading? Uh, it is lately for sure. I love stories. I absolutely love stories. Um, and our church is just full of excellent, excellent stories. And there's too many stories, so that so many fall. So many great stories fall uh, between the cracks. But I think when I was a when I was a teenager, it's probably more doctrinal. Hmm. I was reading. I was reading a lot of books by uh, prophets and apostles, and and yeah, just anything, anything my parents had, anything I could get at the library. Yeah, awesome. Now this has led you to this project on X, which uh, you created an account called Acts of the Apostles, which I think is an awesome uh, title, since in the Bible there's there's a book called the Acts of or the Acts of the Apostles, right? I assume well, that's you. what you're absolutely you were basing yeah. this off. Of. Yeah, absolutely. I'm trying <laughs> to do a modern day Acts of Apostles. That's cool. Where, where did this idea come from? When I was a teenager, my, my dad told me something. Um, he was he was uh, put into a stake presidency by Bruce R. McConkie when I was much, much younger. So I don't even remember it. I was probably uh, early grade school, maybe younger. But he said something in high school that surprised me. He said, you know, the funniest person I've ever met is Bruce R. McConkie. <laughs> Which you wouldn't you wouldn't get from hearing his. Yeah, talks. that's not the uh, typical characteristic of Bruce R. McConkie you hear about. <laughs> no, and my dad is a really funny guy, and he knows lots of funny, funny people. And he only knew Bruce R. McConkie for that weekend. That's the only time he he did it. Uh -huh. He said, I, "I don't think I've ever laughed more than that uh, than that weekend with Bruce R. McConkie." And um, so it made me want to get to know the apostles and prophets, uh, not just what we see on the podium, but I, I just want to get to know who they were. And uh, yeah, so that's that's yeah. basically it. And I was telling my dad this. I was reminding him about this lately. And he said that, you know, who reminds me of Bruce R. McConkie is the savior on The Chosen. You know how the savior on The Chosen oh, yeah. is kind of funny and he's just, he puts everybody at ease. He goes, yeah, that was, sure. Bruce, that was Bruce R. McConkie. Oh, wow. So, wow. it, it, and, and uh, anyways, and you, you read the book about Bruce R. McConkie written by his son, and that actually really, really comes through. Yeah. 
I remember reading that. Uh, I, I, it's been so many years, uh, but there's certain stories in there that I remember like him, he would sort of uh, rehearse like talks as he drove down the, the road. Mm-hmm. As, you remember that, that portion? Because he's known as this orator, right? That, mm-hmm. that was just so captivating from the lectern and you could tell he was well-practiced. I mean, and you think back then in the, I don't know what it was, 40s, 50s, you know, there was, there probably wasn't a lot of radio stations, let alone podcasts to listen to. Right, right, and yeah. So, you know, when you're driving an hours, hours and hours of driving, there's, that's sort of what you do, you know, that's you, how you, entertain you, you practice yourself. your talk. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, really cool. Um, and then, so from there, have you been recording just these stories that, that captured you as you read? church history or and that you decided to put them on x no well i a couple of years ago i thought it would be awesome i wanted to hear a podcast where they start with thomas b marsh go all the way to ulysses stories in just one episode <laughs> and i thought yes. okay i'll do that so i just started every time i was at di if i saw a, an apostle's biography i'd pick it up oh yeah um and then i tried my first one with thomas b marsh and it was it was dismal i mean i was just stumbling i could not i could not get that 20 minutes or whatever i was trying to do and so i put that on the back burner um but i kept reading the stories and then just making a mark if there was a story that i was like oh i'd love it basically if there was any story i wanted to stop whatever my wife was doing and tell her like interrupt Mm. her if it was a story that i wanted to interrupt my wife to tell her if it was that good, I'd make a little mark. And at the beginning of this year, I realized, okay, I've got all these stories, uh, got all these marks in these books. And I thought, well, it'll take, it'll take 20 minutes a day to put a story on Twitter. And so that's how it started. Nice. And so you, you basically go through random apostles. You're not necessarily going in any particular order, right? No, it was very random at the beginning. Now I try to do like one from the first 10 apostles, then one from the 11 to 20. So I'm trying not to, uh, I'm not I'm trying not to miss any eras when I go. And then I get up to, you know, up to, uh, apostle like 87 or whatever. And then I'll go back and do the first one of the first 10 and just try to cycle through. Yeah. And to put that into context, so elder Renland was the 100th apostle called in modern times, right? Yes. And so, uh-huh. and we've had a few more since then, obviously. And so there's roughly been a hundred plus, uh, get, you know, uh, with additional, a few more of apostles called, uh, that's a life for each one, obviously with full yes. of stories. And many of them have biographies or at least things written about them. And that's where you're diving into. Yes. I'm starting. Mo- yeah. I don't know what I'll do when I get to the ones that don't have a biography written about them. <laughs> so nice. Yeah. Well, there's always a, a obscure, you know, passage or writing out there, journal entry, maybe you'll, yep. you'll stumble across, but maybe not a lot. So, um, and then, so basically, I love seeing on on X the the updates of the pictures. You know, the, your the profile picture of your Acts of the Apostles page updates, yeah. depending on who you're talking about that week or that for that uh, that series mm-hmm. of of threads on on X. Yeah, I try to put a really young picture of them. Usually, when they're mm-hmm. in their twenties, or maybe if, if they're on their mission, I'll put a picture there. Mm-hmm. So there's sometimes, you know, right now I'm doing Howard W. Hunter. And I guess a lot of people have seen young ones. Whenever you've got a prophet or a president, there's a lot of biographies and a lot of yeah. pictures. Uh, but then you have somebody like, say, well, James E. Talmadge, like his his picture when he was a young man. I mean, it's just it just endears you to him. You know what I yeah. mean? It's it, uh, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I think when they're the older pictures, I mean, anybody who's older looks like a wise sage, you know, it's yep. like this, this guy's got stories and wisdom that I've got to hear, but it uh, humanizes them a little bit to see him as a, you know, <laughs> they're just figuring out life as a 20, 30 year old, like the rest of us. Yeah, they don't, they don't know where the story ends. They have no yeah. idea what's about to happen. And yeah. you kind of see that when you see the pictures. Now is Howard W. Hunter the first apostle that you're doing that later became the president of the church? I don't think so it might be and i can't remember because i've i've now got a bit of head of when i oh. like i'm i'm working on david o mckay right now in my readings and yeah 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 and so to be honest with you i'm not sure i might have done okay. one before now gotcha but you'll do uh, whether they became prophet of the church or not you're oh. you're exploring the lives of the acts of the apostles so that's really cool one through 103 now that we got patrick here and it's 103 no i did do george albert smith Oh, nice. And George Albert Smith was great. And I've already researched Heber J. Grant, which has 
one of my top five stories. I cannot wait to tell that one uh, when we <laughs> get awesome. to it. It's so funny. It's such a good That's story. Cool. That's cool. And and you're mainly focusing on specific stories, not necessarily quotes or general conference talks. These are stories from their life. Yeah, I was originally going to do I was originally going to do like stories and quotes. And I just gravitated to the stories um, yeah. for whatever reason. I love the quotes. Wow. Um, and when I do Ezra T. Benson, Ezra Taft Benson's grandfather, I'll probably have more quotes because his biography was like kind of short on stories. Hmm. but long on amazing quotes. So, so wow. on that one, I think I'll, I'll do a little bit more quotes. Yeah, no, this is great. And uh, we're, we're talking behind the scenes, seeing how ways that we can further, uh, uh, you know, share these stories uh, through the leading saints platform and whatnot. But in the meantime, uh, definitely people should check out your X account. We'll link to it, of course, acts of the apostles. And just a little caveat here a few years ago, I think this was, one of the first people I ever interviewed on the podcast, he had mentioned just this off comment about how much he loved the stories you hear from general conference or in other, mm-hmm. uh, other places of, of, you know, I was, you know, I was visiting a, a state conference, you know, this is an apostle or a, a 70 with, you know, Neil A. Maxwell. And we were yeah. driving to the church and he said this thing, like this, this wisdom that's passed within these, these leaders. And I called it teachers, or I'm sorry, I called it leaders teaching leaders. And then I, I shortened it to leader to leader. And so yeah. I had these short episodes. This was years ago. And you can still find them on the podcast or on the website where I uh, clip out these stories that are told from the lectern of General Conference and shared. And I, I just love hearing these things. So you have to flag me when uh, when you come across those types of stories because they're, they're all over in these biographies. Oh, absolutely. Because they're all being mentored by yes. somebody that was in the possible forum. Well, I think the best, and I think you'd mentioned um, earlier that you'd read this, but the Henry B. Eyring biography is yeah. rich in that. I mean, the mm-hmm. stories about what he learned from Harold B. Lee and Boyd K. Packer and a bunch of the other ones, really powerful stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a great thing. You know, if there's a leader out there and I don't know that, you know, when you're serving as bishop or in some of these leadership roles, it's a very busy time. But I would really encourage you to, to pick up these books from time mm-hmm. to time or read a chapter or two. And it is uh, so comforting to just sort of see their life from that perspective. And you learn so yeah. much and gain so much respect for these, these individuals. And then when they stand in conference and speak, you're, they're just, you're more endeared toward them. You know, it's just, it's awesome. For That's sure. absolutely right. Cool. Anything else about the, the account that people should look for or things you're doing there or. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, please. Uh, uh, if you have any comments, a lot of people are, um, well, if I make a mistake, I really appreciate people uh, correcting me. Sometimes I'll sometimes I'll say something. I just said Howard W. Hunter was the uh, first apostle from Idaho. Uh, he's actually the third apostle from Idaho. I found out oh, yeah. really quickly. So, so come on, and or if there's a story you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll uh, like I did M. Russell Ballard fairly recently, and a lot of people had M. Russell Ballard stories that just experiences they'd had with him. It's very touching. Mm. To oh, hear yeah. them. I love when people share stuff like that. And so, yeah, yeah please, uh, yeah, please feel free to pre- feel free to reach out to me. I love uh, share what you've got. I think, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Howard W. Hunter, he was one of the few apostles that was called to as an apostle of from a, being a stake president, right? Like yeah. he didn't go through the the typical well, ranks of 70 and whatnot. And he's just a, a stake president in California. Yeah, just a great and, stake uh, president. Here we go. Good yeah. job. Uh, yeah, him and Spencer W. Kimball are the only two I know about. I'm sure there were other ones, but yeah, uh, yeah, he was. yeah. I still remember reading about Spencer W. Kimball. The phone call he gets, I think, it is you know, his son's like, "Hey, someone's on the phone for you," and there he's in the kitchen being called as an apostle. And he's yes. like, well, you know, who the rest of his life was changed for sure. Oh man, yeah, and the, and our church as well. I mean, that, oh, yeah. that guy was a powerhouse. Oh man. Love it. All right. So one thing we want to do is, you know, you've you've told so many stories about different apostles that we just maybe want to focus on one or two during this uh, during this this uh, recording. And of course, you know, I'd love to have you back on. Maybe we can s- explore some others and uh, learn from them, and especially the leadership principles that are that are uh, that we can harvest from from these lives. So we're going to talk about uh, first James E. Talmadge yeah. and sort of do a, a, a quick deep dive on his life. This is one. I mean, any generally any member of the church here's 
Jamesy Talmadge and you think Jesus the Christ, as far as the book, Jesus the Christ that he wrote in the temple. And I've been in the room, you know, where supposedly he lived and, and wrote and things like have, that. So, have you really? uh, yeah. So if you're yeah, a, awesome. I was a temple worker there for a few, a few short months uh -huh. and, uh, and yeah, you can go back there and, and there's the fireplace there and things like that. So again, oh, it may yeah. be wrong. I'm, we're open to any uh, correction on, as you, as you say, we may, we may uh, perpetuate some faith promoting uh, right. rumors here that aren't actually stories. And that's the, that's sometimes the tricky thing is I'll hear stories at times. And I think, Ooh, that's yeah. not actually accurate. Right. And so we're well, open to being one of, corrected. one of the only things I thought I knew about uh, James E. Talmadge was that uh, Albert Einstein said he was the smartest person he knew. I heard that on my mission. And so, Oh really? I, yeah. Is it and, true? No. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I doubt it. I doubt it's true. Uh, because James E. Talmadge was a little bit before Albert Einstein. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, Albert yeah. Einstein, it's probably mixing some stories because Albert Einstein was good friends with Henry B. Eyring's dad. Uh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And, that's uh, another good one. There's the Mormon scientist, that book about oh, uh, President Eyring's dad is phenomenal. Love that book. Oh, yeah. man. I recommend that to everybody. Yes. Very good. Yeah. My favorite yeah. part is when um, he's telling... He's telling Einstein about uh, the plan of salvation. You know oh, what I mean? I he's forget telling, that part. Oh, yeah. He's telling about the gospel and the plan of salvation. And uh, Einstein goes, well, what about dogs? And uh, he, said, he said, what? What about dogs? He oh. was concerned about what happens to dogs. <laughs> of course. And, and uh, uh, Henry Eyring Sr. He said, well, I'm not quite sure if it's anything's been said, but God loves dogs. I'm sure he's up there. And he said that <laughs> Einstein seemed very pleased with that response. Nice. Awesome. All right. Back to James E. Talmadge okay. here. So where's a good uh, jumping off point? I, I assume there's a biography. I've never read yeah. his biography, if there is one. There is. There's a very good one. Um, it's written by his son. Hmm. And a lot of times my favorite apostle biographies are actually written by their sons because mm, you can yeah. just sort of feel the affection. And they've got a lot of family stories. Like there are several times in this book on James E. Talmadge, it's like, he never wrote about this in his journal, but we we told the story and teased him about it all the time. There's one story I'll tell later that that awesome. he's like, yeah, he never wrote about it in his journal, never talked about it, but we mentioned it to him constantly. Nice, so, love it. Yeah, so it, it was written by his son, um, like I think in the late set or early seventies or something, well after he had passed away. And it's a good one. It's got a lot of good stories. It gives you a good idea of what kind of a guy he was to, to actually know him. Know him. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Well, where should we go? Where should we start with James E. Talmadge? Well, the one thing everybody knows about him, so I'll just get this out of the way, is Jesus the Christ. Um, it's it's actually, if you think about uh, books that have been written, I think it was like 19, it was in the 1910s that it was written. And on Goodreads, it's still like in the top maybe 12. I mean, it's like, and you look at the other books uh, below it, you're like, yep, I heard of that. Everything after, not so much. Like, it's, it's amazing that a book's had that longevity. So it's in the top 12 of, of, of what on Goodreads? On Goodreads, uh, of people that still write reviews and are still oh, saying okay. they read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And most books, I mean, in 100 years, most books are gone. The fact that it's, most church books actually are gone. Very few of them last that long. Hmm. But for Jesus the Christ to last that long is, is absolutely amazing. He wrote it in seven months and five days. Wow. Yeah. I mean, he's a workhorse. <laughs> we'll talk about his work ethic later on, but he was an absolute workhorse. Um, and it's, it's impressive, but you have to realize he was also, he had written lectures. He'd already done a lecture series on each chapter. So he'd already done. Yeah, Cause he research. was a professor, right? That was his day job. Yeah. He was a, he was a professor. He was a, a geologist. He was a professor of geology. And, uh, and so, uh, and a very, very good lecture, a very, very good lecture. Hmm. Um, as a matter of fact, I was going to talk about this later, but I'll talk about it now because I'm thinking about it. He, yeah. um, when he was an apostle, if there was a hostile audience, they would send James E. Talmadge because <laughs> he could get up there and you'd have a crowd that just did not like the church. You know what I mean? It just, it just had heard bad things about the church and he could tell the story of Brigham Young and coming over to Utah and he would have him in tears by the end. He would have him at the oh, end. Wow. They'd be like, wow, Brigham Young's the greatest American ever. You know what I mean? He would just, <laughs> he was just able to capture people uh, that way. I don't know that any of those talks were written down or anything, but that, I mean, if I had a time machine, that's, yeah, I would love to go and sit and listen to one of those, one of those lectures. Wow. So, yeah. That's great. 
And then you talk about him, the bravery mixed with compassion. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, okay. So he was, he was an incredibly brave person and he was also a very compassionate uh, person at the same, at the same time. And, um, but I think he was brave first. Like when he was a, when he was a child, he, that was one of the things. And he, he got that from his family, uh, his grandpa, he was a third generation, uh, member being born in 1862 in Great Britain, which was unusual. Oh, wow. It means his dad was one or his grandpa was one of the first ones to be uh, baptized. And his grandpa was the leader of an anti-Mormon mob that was coming in to kick the kick the missionaries out. They'd heard what they were up to. They, they didn't want him in there. And there was something about the missionaries uh, dignity and just the way they comported themselves that touched him. And he ended up actually like leading them to safety and, and hiding them in his house. And while wow. he was hiding them in the house and telling the mob, no, they're not here. Uh, they ran off somewhere else. Uh, he heard the message and was touched and became a lifelong, very faithful, very faithful member. And so wow. there was bravery in his family. There was absolute bravery in his family. And um, there is a story that, and this is one that he never really told. He talked about it in his journal. We know about it because his son told it, but he would talk about it every once in a while. And uh, it was the story of his baptism. And, and there was uh, anti-Mormon sentiment back then was pretty strong. And so you could not baptized during the day you couldn't go to the river because people would come and they just make it a miserable experience i mean they would just mm -hmm. come and they would jeer and they would they would make life miserable for you so what they would do is they would go to the river after dark and they would uh somebody would go walk around the town a half hour before to make sure that there weren't people walking around when the town seemed quiet and safe the, the crowd would hurry to the river then they'd do the baptism uh when they got there on that night, he was 11 years old. He didn't get baptized at eight. He got baptized at 11. And uh, when his father stepped into the river, there was all of a sudden this just unearthly shriek. The way he talks about it was just like it was worse than anything you've ever heard. Just like a yell, wail. Just, I mean, just made the hair on the back of their, their neck stand up. And his father turned to him. And uh, his father... His father said, uh, he asked, well, this is in his words. Father asked me if I was too frightened to be baptized. And I answered by directly stepping into the water. And as soon as he stepped into the water, uh, the noise ceased. There was no more noise. And they went and they did the, um, the baptism. Wow, and they, so they didn't know where this sound was coming from. No, they had no idea. They had no Holy idea. Cow. And James E. Talmadge was a—he was—he had a scientific mind as a kid. He never would speculate what it was. If he didn't know what something was, he wouldn't try to like come up with a theory about what it was. They just so like he would never speculate about it. Um, he would just tell the story flat. But what I love about that story is that eleven-year-old boy. You think of these deacons last week that were. Uh, that were uh, set apart, the 11 year old set apart as deacons. He was that age. And uh, even with that noise, he stepped into the water. It's dark. And so I love, I absolutely love that about him. Yeah. Wow. And, and, and one thing I'm, I didn't know, I didn't, I mean, uh, technically, James E. Talmadge was British then. Oh, yeah. He was, wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and the third generation, which, so his grandfather, after joining the church, didn't, didn't come to Zion per se, right? No, no. And wow. his father, his father did with James E. Talmadge when James E. Talmadge was a, when James E. Talmadge was a teenager, hmm. he did. So, but his father, yeah, his father was a grown man and they were still living, working in, in Great Britain. They had branches there. And, wow. Yeah. So do, do you know, if did James E. Talmadge have much of an English accent uh, in his adult life or did That's, that wear off? That's an excellent question, and I don't know. I don't uh, that's know. That's interesting. I yeah. just don't think of him as a uh, as English, so that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So he was British, and um, yeah. And so the next day, they asked people around town, "Hey, did you hear that noise last night?" And nobody had heard it. Nobody had heard it. Wow. And so that's the end. You're kind of an interesting. Interesting. Story. Yeah. Just some uh, maybe some spiritual warfare going on there. The the uh, the demons were not. Uh, happy of what was happening so. not happy yeah yeah <laughs> wow so tell me about this uh, schoolmaster that hated the church okay so yeah so he went to um he went to the hungerford national school in the west country of england and he was he was young 
And his schoolmaster hated the church, just absolutely hated it, and would bring it up all the time in, um, in school. And, uh, and so James E. Talmadge, he was not one to ever back down from anything, even as a young, as a young man. I mean, he wasn't disrespectful or anything, but he would challenge the uh, schoolmaster. And since they did corporal punishment back there, he got beat Oof. all the time by a schoolmaster. Wow. As a matter of fact, he always referred to that school as the place where I received so many thrashings. That's how he re- re- uh, referred to that uh, uh, school. But what I love about it is, one, he had the courage to stand up for his convictions. But the rest of the story make, just makes me love James E. Talmadge and actually his old teacher as well. So when he was an adult, he was quite famous in the, sci- uh, the scientific community. And he would go over to England all the time. And when he did, he always visited that schoolmaster. He would Mm. never go over to England without visiting that schoolmaster. And um, the schoolmaster was really, really proud of him. Just super proud of him. Uh, Especially because of his scientific achievements. He'd he'd bring James E. Talmadge to the school to to visit the children. He'd, He'd introduce him to his friends. And he would never understand how such a good scientist could come from that church. That he never really changed. <laughs> like he never, he, he just didn't believe that he thought this was a one-off. Um, but James E. Talmadge had such compassion um, and such love for people that he would visit him every single time. And they, they had a great relationship. Wow. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, and then a uh, college friend. Uh, tell me that story. Yeah. Okay. So this was later. Uh, this is when he was in college. College. Uh, he went to, I don't know how to pronounce it, Lehigh in Pennsylvania. It's still a college. Um, hmm. But he went over there uh, and then went to Johns Hopkins. And it was a real libertine type place. Uh, There's a lot of well to do and like the upper echelon, the kids of the upper echelon. But man, they were, they did not keep the law of chastity and they bragged about it. And they were, it was a lot like, uh, I guess, young people nowadays. You yeah, know what I mean? Like a party school, different. right? <laughs> it was kind of the party school. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was kind of the the party school. And um, he, uh, there was one one person and, and James E. Talmadge liked them all. He really did. He was disturbed. He was constantly disturbed, but he liked, he liked them all and they liked him. They, they genuinely liked him. And there was one student named William that would tease uh, tease James all the time for being, you know, old fashioned and a prude. And he would always try to bait. Uh, he would always try to bait him into arguments about morality. And and eventually, uh, James E. Talmadge had 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 enough. And he says, uh, "All right, William," said James. "Let us assume for the moment you are right, and there is no God and no hereafter. And suppose we were both to die tonight." which one of us would have lived the fuller life? And uh, William answered, oh, I suppose people would say you had, uh, but I prefer the present enjoyment rather than whatever great funeral oration you're going to have. And uh, and then uh, James E. Thomas was like, no, fair enough, fair enough. Now, for the sake of argument, let us assume that I am right and all of us will have to account for our actions before God. Again, we suppose we both die tonight. Now, which of us has the advantage? And William the, the way he describes it, he just took it in with the same sort of detachment. And then all of a sudden he blanched and his face went white. He kind of looked scared and he whispered, my God, he whispered, may it not be so. And um, then the conversation just sort of resumed and changed to other topics. But William never, never again tried to bait uh, James into a debate. And James <laughs> never forgot the look on his face right there. He wasn't expecting it to land quite that well, but Wow. Interesting. So, I mean, in those developmental years or, or those young adult years, I mean, he, he faced some opposition, right? Like it wasn't, uh, and, and that he had to be brave, but also had moments of, of compassion as he, he leaned in and uh, called people to repentance. Called people to repentance in the best, nice, nicest way possible, but they're really like, I mean, it struck him. You, you could tell. So. Yeah. Love it. All right. Where do we go from here? So he was, he was a lecturer uh, at a very early age. Like he would, he would lecture around the territory about science, and he had. Uh, so one of the things I learned from James E. Talmadge is that uh, just go do it, and it's not always going to be great at the beginning. But when you're starting a new 
a new uh, skill or new leadership, or you just got called to something that you're overwhelmed with, just mm. get in there and just do it. Pe- people like it when you're when uh, you're vulnerable, and they they like to see you get better. And they like to see the Lord's. Uh, they like to see the Lord in your life, the Lord uh, uh, building you up. Uh, there was a great story about when um, he was, he must have been 17 or 18. He was a protege of Carl G. Mazur at BYU, at the Brigham Young Academy. And he would do these lectures at night. And it was hard to get people interested in science. And then he did one where he was, when he was 18, he was already always ready doing uh, lectures on science and he tried to make it really, really interesting and he was good. And the people that came really liked it, but not everybody would come. And it just didn't seem like a, the most fun thing to do. Uh, but one night he was trying to show how you, if you explode oxygen and hydrogen, you can make H2O. And so he's doing it in the glass cylinder and the glass cylinder burst so suddenly and loudly and with such force that all the lamps extinguished in the room. And the glass just shattered over the entire audience. Uh, oh, one goodness. young lady was struck in the forehead by a piece of glass and she fainted. And, uh, and there were some other injuries, but nothing too bad. I mean, everybody, nobody had to go to the hospital or anything. And uh, the admin at the Butte Righam Young Academy apparently were really afraid that after that, nobody would dare come to one of his lectures. <laughs> but the exact opposite happened. All of a sudden, it became like the most popular thing to do. It'd be... They, people had heard about that. And all of a sudden there were standing room clouds only. Everybody wanted to come to it. Wow. <laughs> He's a good marketer for science there. Yeah. <laughs> you want absolutely. to see something explode. Yep. That's awesome. And that was at uh, Brigham Young Academy that, and he was a professor at that time. He, well, yeah, he was a teacher. I don't know if he was, if he would have called himself a professor. Cause this was actually okay. before he went to Johns Hopkins. He was young. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. He was, he was, oh, yeah. he, was he, said he was 18. So. That's right. Okay. So this, yeah, this was before. Um, and then there's there's another story about him when he's older. This is when he's president of the University of Utah, and he he kept a pretty regular schedule. And he got home late one night, which was surprising to his family. But he came home just bloody and just covered in mud and like grass, and and they thought maybe he'd like fallen into a mud. I mean, they didn't know what happened. Maybe he was mugged or something. They didn't know. Um, but what had actually happened is uh, he, the bicycle with a chain just came into, was just invented. It made bicycles a lot safer. And that became his regular mode of transportation. And he would ride all the way home from the University of Utah, except for one place where there was a plank over a ditch. And he would get off and he would walk across the, the plank. But he felt comfortable enough riding his bicycle that he decided that he was just going to go over it. No big deal. So he did, but he went a little too oblong, slid right off the, uh, right off the plank into the ditch. And he was bruised. He's a little embarrassed. And he thought, okay, well, I'm not going home until I get over that, that plank. So he went and he tried it one more time, went into the ditch again, just did it (laughs) over and over again. And he was not going to, he was not going to quit. And I don't know, he lost count of how many times or how long it took. Um, but eventually he got over and just to make sure he'd learned the lesson, he went back and he did it three more times. And so that was, that was how he, that was how he problem solved. He just did it head on. He wasn't afraid of failure. He yeah. was just, he would just get up and do it again. Um, he did say though, that he never went over that ditch without feeling a tinge of fear. <laughs> I bet. And, and this is, I mean, just kind of reveals something of his character because they see him as such an accomplished scientist that it probably took some, some resilience to get there, right. Oh. To, to keep trying and messing up and, and, you know, moving forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. A good way to think about him. Um, and I don't know that there's any spiritual lesson to get from this, uh, but I do think it's fascinating is he was almost like an Indiana Jones of the Utah territory. So a lot of his scientific stuff was just doing expeditions out into where people hadn't gone. So he would just have like four pack animals, some students, some other teachers, and they would just head off into the Utah desert and look for stuff. Like they were, um, I mean, they weren't the first person to go down the Grand Canyon, but they went down the north face of the Grand Canyon when not very many people had and explored down there. And it actually became 
Well, let me start earlier, actually. This is actually, there is actually a spiritual lesson to be learned here. So when he was sent, he asked Carl G. Mazur if he could go east, just if it would be a good idea. And they said, well, you should go talk to John Taylor. And they decided to just treat it as a mission and set him apart as if he was, as if what he was doing was a mission. And Wilford Woodruff set him apart. And he said something surprising that I don't know that I would have trusted. But he said, uh, don't, when you go over there, get what you have to do and come right back to Utah. Do not get extra uh, extra uh, diplomas and honors. Come back to Utah. And then they promised everything will come when you come back. And hmm. it's absolutely true. He found this, uh, this type of mineral uh, in the uh, Capitol Reef area. And he would just start sending it to museums all over the world. And it was a really like cherished thing. Like they were, it, it was some museums like prized possession. And that's one of the ways that he got to know so many, uh, so many um, scientists around the world. And he was able to trade that, those rocks for uh, stuff from, you know, Europe. So Utah all of a sudden got all these amazing things here and he never would have received the honors he did if he had stayed east or gone to the continent because he would have been one of many he would have done very well he would have done very well but yeah. coming back to utah and just going out with pack animals and finding stuff all of a sudden he became like a real celebrity in the science world like they invited him to the royal uh, society, Royal Scientific Society of Edinburgh. I think I got that name wrong, but uh, which was normally uh, somebody that lived in America couldn't do, but they they pulled some strings and he didn't ask to be a part of it. They were just, they loved him so much and they were so impressed with the stuff they were bringing. All these scientific societies from Utah or from uh, Europe were inviting him to be in these just amazing, amazing societies. And so Wilford Woodruff was really prophetic when he said that he never would have become the man he was if he'd have stayed there searching for that. It all came to him just by being here and being him. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely work for him to do here. Yeah. Know, in, in yeah. Utah, the influence there. That's awesome. Any other sci scientific exploits he, he had? I mean, the first thing, the first thing that really brought him notoriety was he got a microscope. He, he, he bought a microscope when it was first coming out and would start just looking at everything. Um, but the one thing that really got him noticed was brine shrimp. He put brine shrimp on microscopes and then he'd send it to other microscope enthusiasts all around the world. <laughs> and so his wow. first big thing that he got was the Royal Microscopic Society. They, they asked him to join. And back then, the scientific societies were a big deal. I was trying to think of anything that was as big a deal now that would be as impressive. And I actually couldn't, I mean, it, I have a story later on where people reacted to him being in those societies. And um, I don't know that there's any, uh, anything nowadays that would, that would cause quite the reaction. I mean, it was, it was like all of a sudden somebody is just like, Hey, do you want to be a member of Congress? No, you don't have to, you don't have to run for it. Just come on and be in Congress. It'd be something like that. You know what I mean? Or, okay, come, come join the yeah. Royal family almost is, is what it was looked on. I mean, that people love those scientific societies back then. Wow. Interesting. That's awesome. Well, should we uh, move on to, uh, let's see, compassion mixed with bra bravery before we were talking about bravery mixed with compassion, but yeah, absolutely. And this is actually, this is, I, I've had this story. I had more, I've had more response to than any other story. Like, like this is why this was the first time I told a story that people like just people that weren't interested in my, in my uh, Twitter feed. Absolutely. Just, you know what I mean? They were still mm -hmm. sharing it. It got shared like crazy. It got uh, more likes than anything since. Um, you guys might have heard this. It's It's been talked about a couple of times in general conference, uh, once by Elder Wordland and once fairly like in the last five or six years. And I completely forgot about it. Um, so in 1892, Utah was hit with diphtheria. There was a diphtheria epidemic and people were dying like crazy. The Relief Society found a non-member family near death and people didn't really know him. So they stumbled on him. And then they couldn't get anybody to help. 
because people were scared that, you know, especially if you had a family, you didn't want to go and get diphtheria and then pass it on to your kids or you die yourself. And so they couldn't, they couldn't find anybody to help. Now, James E. Talmadge was a young father at this time. He was just starting to get known in the scientific community. Um, and when he heard about it, he absolutely, he just rushed there. No question uh -huh. asked. He was there. And what he found was absolutely horrible. One child, uh, a two-year-old, lay dead on her bed. And then a, a boy of 10 and a girl of five were just writhing in agony. And there was a 13-year-old who was improving, but she was still feeble. She couldn't do anything. And the mom and dad were just, just dazed and just, just, uh, just dazed with grief and fatigue. And the, the disease had been there long enough that the house was just in a state of, of utter filth. And so after administering to the children, uh, James, he spent the rest of the day cleaning. He swept and he disinfected and he, he burned all the filthy rags and bathed the children and um, the Relief Society had brought clothes. And so he was able to put them in, in clean clothes. And, um, and the next morning, when he returned, he found out that the 10-year-old boy had died during the night and the little girl of five was in her last agonies. He took her in his arms and he did his best to comfort her. And then this is what he wrote in his journal. She clung to my neck, oft times coughing, bloody mucus on my face and clothing. And her throat had about it the stench of putrefaction, yet I could not put her down. During the last half hour immediately preceding her death, I walked the floor with the little creature in my arms. She died in agony at 10 a.m. Now, because of the plague, bodies were required to be buried immediately. And so they were buried in a single grave. And he said the grief of the parents and the surviving sister were absolutely pitiful to behold. And uh, James, he gave a brief graveside sermon, and the bishop was there too, and he dedicated the grave. And he actually got diphtheria. James E. Talmadge got diphtheria. So he had to go home and be quarantined for a, a week. But he survived. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, he survived. But uh, like that right there is, I mean, how many people, I mean, as a father, you know what I mean? I, yeah, I don't know. That's the kind of, that's the kind of bravery and compassion that, I don't know. I mean, that's just, uh, that's the man I, I want to be. And I hope I would be if that ever happened. Oh, yeah. And, and again, it's just these little, these, these hidden stories that, that build upon these men that now look like, you know, they, they became apostles mm -hmm. of, of Jesus Christ, you know, which is quite a title and a, and a tough platform to stand on. But, you know, God is, is working in them. Just like we think of the stories of Joseph Smith's life, right? All of these apostles had these experiences, just like we all do in our life, that mm -hmm. sanctifies us, as and makes us uh, able to stand in these in these callings and serve, absolutely, uh, and lead. Any other uh, stories of compassion mixed with bravery, or is that uh, that's the big one right there? It's, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the big one right there, and that's that's one of my top favorite stories from any apostle Love ever. It. I mean, it's just something about that I find so touching and just yeah, just powerful. Yeah. All right. How about uh, the Lord calls you to be you? Okay. Did, uh, that manifests in the life of James E. Talmadge. Yeah. So when he was an apostle, he was called to be uh, the mission president of, of Great Britain. And he succeeded David O. McKay, was the one right oh, wow. before him. Like there was a lot of, like if you were called to England, you're an apostle and a really cool, you know, just an amazing apostle was going to be your mission president. Mm -hmm. And when he came, to Great Britain, it was the anti-Mormon sentiment was at its highest ever. I mean, it was just the way that newspapers knew they could sell a paper was they would uh, they would write a headline. This is an actual headline: "Mormon Mysteries Unveiled: A Girl's Awful Revelations," and they would put that on the paper, and it would sell. I mean, it would absolutely sell. Are you saying fake news existed back then? This oh, is it. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, absolutely, it did. And uh, in uh, London on the West End, one of the most popular plays was a play called Eve and the Elders. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I actually tried to find the play to see if it was maybe online or maybe on um, Google Books or something. I couldn't find it. Um, but it was quite popular at the time. And I don't know anything about it except that the elders are members. And Eve, of course, is she's in a lot of danger. And, yeah. and so at that time... 
uh, there was very little missionary work was very hard to do because everybody just thought the, the Mormons were absolute trouble. And so uh, James E. Talmadge, and I think the Lord, I think the Lord, a lot of the things that happened earlier in his life were preparing him for just this moment, for just this moment. So he would go to a hostile newspaper uh, to speak with the editor. And when he would go to the front desk, he would offer his calling card and whoever was the clerk or whatever would go back, come back, and they'd be like, uh, regretfully, the elder's schedule is so full, he couldn't possibly find time to visit. So Elder Tamage expected this, and he would say, oh, I, sorry, I just forgot something. Um, he would write down on his card, he would write F-R-S-E-F-R-M-S and F-R-G-S. And that was the... Uh, the Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Fellow of the Royal Microscopic Society, and the Fellow of the Royal Geological Society. And oh, the wow. clerk knew exactly what, the, everybody knew what those were, uh, just by the initials. And the clerk would look at it, look back at him and be like, I will be right back. He would go <laughs> and uh, he'd be like, oh, they would love to see you. He may not today, can you come back tomorrow? Or they'd see him right then. I mean, everything would just change. What I said earlier about those, those societies, like they were as respected as anything. As a matter of fact, around that time, uh, the Prince of Wales was going to be inducted into the Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And that was like the best thing for the prince. I mean, the prince was honored for wow. that. And so that's what it meant. And so, so once he would talk to the editor and everybody that talked to James E. Talmadge absolutely loved him, absolutely loved him. Once he would talk to James E. Talmadge, all of a sudden, they just they didn't have the taste for putting that in. And so he would just go to newspaper to newspaper and do that. And then every once in a while, a story like that would come. And James E. Talmadge was friends with the editor. He goes, do you mind if I write a rebuttal? And he would write this rebuttal. And just anti-Mormonism in the newspapers just sort of went away. It just went away. Hmm. Wow. So nobody else could have done that. That was the one thing that, I mean, he was probably the one man on earth at that time who could have done that. Yeah. And I do think like in leadership, like there are things you can do that nobody else can do. Like you don't have to be the bishop before you who's super, who is super cool. You don't have to worry about being him. Like the Lord called you to be you. Yeah. And there, I just think of, you know, the, the diplomatic uh, uh, efforts of different members of the church, whether they're an official calling or maybe they're a politician or somebody who's well-respected in a business community, uh, you know, they can, they, there's stories of those people reaching out and that those types of things happen in smaller communities as well. You know, Absolutely. maybe the bishop can't get into that house, but you know what, their next door neighbor, who's the executive secretary five years ago or whatever, like they have a relationship there and maybe there's some, connections that uh, that or they can work on the the established respect the mutual respect in that relationship to reach out and help and and build restore the good name of the church in that area or the good name of the bishop or whatever it is yeah that's absolutely right yeah all right we're winding down here with james okay. down again i mean such an accomplished person uh he deserves his own podcast, to be honest. But uh -huh. uh, I, yeah. well, we know, Brian, you're a little busy. So <laughs> <laughs> so where, where do you want to go next as we wrap up? Well, okay, there's one quick story that's just a great story. Um, and it's, I'm so glad I know it now. And it's, it's one of those church history stories that you just, you wish you knew it your whole life. But like I'd said earlier, like there's just too many stories. Our yeah. church is just full of stories. Even the best stories are just going to fall between the cracks. And so the, he was, he was known as a workhorse and, um, he would work hour after hour, day after day, and he wouldn't do recreation. It just did not interest him. And this really concerned his family. It really concerned the other members of the 12, uh, Heber J. Grant, uh, was constantly telling him, you got to take up a sport. You got to do some, <laughs> you got to do a sport. Like recreation or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Heber J. Grant was really serious, really concerned. And he's like, I know just the thing for you. You are going to love golf. Uh, <laughs> I, I took up golf. It's my favorite thing. You know, he was like, he was like, and, and, uh, uh, James E. Talmadge was just like, ah, no, no, thank you. I, I'm busy. I'm, I'm doing everything. And, and so eventually, uh, president, uh, Grant, uh, well, he figured if, if he had just made one one good shot, he'd be hooked for life. He was just sure of this. 
<laughs> and so eventually they reached a compromise. President Grant would teach uh, him how to play golf. And after learning to make one good shot, he'd decide whether to continue. If he decided to quit, President Grant would cease his requests. And so, okay, so on that day, they get to the golf course and there's President Grant, there's Elder Talmadge, there's several other general authorities, didn't say who, um, but there was a bunch of other general authorities and they met with Elder Talmadge at Nibley Park for the first lesson. And after President Grant demonstrated how to grip the club and how to do a golf stroke, it was uh, Elder Talmadge's turn. And I don't know, do you play golf? I mean, yeah, I, I, a couple times a year. I'm not okay. like an avid golfer. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, I'm a new <laughs> golfer. I've played a few times and I'm absolutely oh, cool. horrible. I'm absolutely horrible. And so, uh, so, you know, like when you're starting out with golf, it's, uh, you, you're either going to hit it a few feet or you're going to miss. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a tough sport. Um, Elder Talmadge hit the ball 200 yards and it stayed in the fairway. <laughs> so, oh my goodness. Yeah, you read about the, the spectators. Uh, this is how they wrote about it. They were just momentarily struck dumb. And then they burst into applause. And President Grant uh, shook his hand and said, congratulations, that is a shot you'll remember for the rest of your life. And Elder Talmadge was like, you mean that was a fully satisfactory golf shot? And President Grant was like, oh, yeah, it certainly was. And then Elder Talmadge said, then I have fulfilled my part of the agreement. And President Grant said, you have. Let's go down to the clubhouse and I'll help you select your first set of clubs. And Elder Talmadge said, oh, thank you. If I have fulfilled my part of the agreement, then I shall call on you to live up to yours. I should like to get back to my office where I have a great deal of work. And he never played golf again. That was the last, <laughs> that was the last golf ball he ever shot. Oh, my goodness. Mic drop moment. Just <laughs> that'll do. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I love that. Isn't that great. Yeah. Love that. Well, we can't. We can't uh not talk about his effort in, in writing Jesus the Christ is, you know, just a hallmark yeah. uh, effort uh, accomplishment that uh, he did. Uh, what, tell us more. Tell us more about that. Yeah. So it was uh, took him seven months and five days and he was at the temple 24 seven. I mean, he was a real workhorse and that was one of the things that got people worried about him. That was why people were worried he was working so hard, but he, he just he just felt like if he had a project, he was going to see it through, and he would just give it his all. And now, it, uh, I mean, it's blessed so many lives, and uh, and continues to to bless the lives of missionaries as they read it on their missions. You oh, know, I remember that was my first interaction with it. So. It's an absolute classic. Yeah, it's a very that's a powerful book. It is. It is. All right. Uh, what about his, uh, his death? Well, so one of the one of the things. And this is one of those moments where it's, 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 he died actually, you, you get to the end of their life and you realize he died at like 70 and you realize, oh man, that, that feels young to me. That actually feels yeah. young to me, especially with, with Russell M. Nelson, just with all of his energy at 99, you know what I mean? And just what a blessing he's been, uh, what a blessing he's been for, uh, to the church, uh, at his age. Um, but he died at 70 from, a, from complications of a strep throat. And it was about 10 years before penicillin. Oh, and wow. Yeah. So, and if it wasn't treated right away, it could be deadly. And so he finished a radio address and took his, one of his kids, maybe it was his son, maybe it was his daughter, maybe all of them, out to get ice cream. And he had a cough that just would not, uh, that would just not get better. And then the next day was Pioneer Day. And so he couldn't go to the doctor's. Uh, because all the doctors were done and he wasn't about to impose himself to any doctors. But then by the next day, it was just, it was too much. And he, uh, he passed away. Uh, he passed away from it. Wow. And gone was the legend, right? Yeah, absolutely. So. I mean, he was, he was definitely, yeah. I mean, just, just an amazing, just an amazing man. So you read about these people, you read about these apostles and then you get to the end and you almost, you know, you, you feel like you know them. A little bit and it's always touching at the end it's always absolutely touching when you get to that yeah wow well this is awesome uh brian this has been so informative and helpful and uh, just exploring a little bit of the life of, of james e talmage and obviously did, what's the name of his biography is it just the life of james e talmage or <laughs> it's the talmage story um and i don't i think it's on kindle i'm not 100 percent sure about this i think it's on kindle it might be out of um, print. I got mine at a DI or somewhere. It'll it'll show up. 
Um, but it's, it's definitely worth tracking down. It's a great, it's a great, it's a great book. Awesome. Is there any, uh, specific biography that isn't, uh, that they're having a hard time finding or. Oh yeah, there are, uh, there's actually quite a few. I would have, I've got a list of biographies that are like over a hundred bucks. You know what I mean? Cause they're just oh, yeah. way out of print. <laughs> you got to save up for those. Yeah, exactly. Or th- some of them are at the BYU library. So eventually I'm going to take a Saturday and come up and read as much as I can. I mean, just spend, <laughs> spend the whole day just reading one of the biographies and taking all the notes when I get to that point, when I run out of my biographies, but maybe take a break and go uh, swing a golf club once. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Go shoot at 200 <laughs> feet. <laughs> Nice. No, that's cool. That's cool. Well, I would encourage people again to go check out your uh, account on X. Uh, again, any anywhere else you would you would send them, or is that sort of the that's all I've the, got the spot? Yeah, yeah, that's all. That's all I've got. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, we've talked offline a little bit. We're going to figure it out. I'd love to have you on and and sort of do this type of thing more and more. And it may not be every you know hundred and third apostle. Uh, in uh you know that we've had uh, in on the podcast feed but we're going to do some things on the youtube channel maybe share some things there on social media so make sure that uh, you're listening that people subscribe to the to leading saints on youtube and we're going to put some really cool stuff there but i'd love to have you back on and, and explore more lives or just have you record uh on your own with uh you know share some some good stories as you do as you share them on x and uh maybe the next one we'll do is John W. Taylor, yeah. uh, which is obscure individual, but maybe tease uh, John W. Taylor uh, of who he was. Okay. So uh, John W. Taylor was, uh, he was the son of John Taylor, uh, the prophet. And his son, John W. Taylor's son, w- was Samuel Woolley Taylor, who wrote The Absent-Minded Professor and Flubber. So the grandson of John <laughs> yeah. Taylor wrote The Absent-Minded Professor. And so uh, cool. He wrote a book about his dad, John W. Taylor. He was one of the apostles that was excommunicated for polygamy after the manifesto. And wow. it is so funny. And it is so like. <laughs> I like wasn't it expecting gives, you to say so funny. <laughs> well, it's the funniest. It's definitely the funniest Mormon history book ever. Because he was obviously a good comedy writer for his time, right? Yeah, he was a very funny. Samuel Willie Taylor is a very funny writer. So he knew how to write. He knew how to write uh, that, that book, that book reads so fast. Um, but John W. Taylor was very, very, he was a character. He was very, very funny. And, um, and you think because of the end, it would be like dark and you know what I mean? It'd just be like kind of a bummer, but he does something at the end that is so faith affirming and so courageous. I cannot wait to tell the story um, that he became one of my heroes. I mean, he really, well, I'll just tell this this part of it. He yeah. really uh, became like he was a rock star at his time. Like he was he was the kind of guy that like people would come to hear because he was really he, everybody loved him. He was very friendly. Um, he was uh, he was very very funny. Um, and so when he got excommunicated, there was a real uh, there was a real fear that he would try to bring people away. And some people mm-hmm. came to him and asked him to. And he said, I will, this is Christ church. I will never, I will never, uh, I will never, uh, how did he put it? Well, oh, I'll do it the next time. But anyways, he, he was somebody who loved people and he really could have gone and started another movement and he refused to do it because, uh, hmm. because this was Christ church and he would never, he would never, 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 uh, betray, awesome. betray that. Um, but the way he does it. So I, the way I did, it was not as, uh, as powerful as when he does it, when he does it, it's just, it gives me chills. Um, yeah. but, but it, it really gives you an idea of what it was like to live in Utah in the early, eight, late 1800s and early 1900s. And it's just one, one banger story after another. Wow. That's awesome. All right. Let's, uh, organize something and, and maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm playing around with some new things in 2024, but, uh, maybe even do a, a, a fun live stream where people can uh, join in and ask some questions or something. I don't know. We'll figure oh, it I out. That. Yeah. And, um, but I'd, yeah, let's learn more about John W. Taylor and the, the highs and lows of, of his life and his okay. apostleship. And again, if people want to check out, um, more acts of the apostles head on over to X and we'll link to it in the, in the show notes. It'd be awesome. So, uh, Brian, the question we ask people, as you know, uh, you've, you've had an opportunity not only to study the lives of leaders, but to be a leader yourself. And how has being a leader helped you become a better follower of Jesus Christ? 
Oh, I love that question. Um, being a leader helped me understand how dependent I was on the Savior. Um, when I had to give words of comfort or be aware enough that I could talk to either, you know, notice somebody new coming into church or somebody that needed a kind word. I couldn't do that on my own. And before I was a leader, I think I would just sort of let the days go by. I mean, I would just, I, I wouldn't think much about it, but being a leader, I had to, I had to humble myself and go to the savior and realize that I cannot do this without, without him. 